May I ask those who are vacating the public gallery to do so quickly and quietly, please. The next item of business is members' business debate on motion 15696 in the name of Jamie Green on delivering sustainable and renewable transportation for Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Jamie Green to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. First of all, can I thank members from right across the chamber, uh, some of them aren't here, uh, from right across the political spectrum for supporting my motion that allowed this debate to take place. Deputy Presiding Officer, delivering sustainable and renewable transport network uh, is an absolute necessity if we as a, as a parliament and as a country are serious about meeting our climate change obligations, something, something I feel shares uh, wide uh, cross-party support. And the premise of my debate today really is just to stimulate a sensible conversation around how we can use technology specifically uh, to help get people moving, to make public transport more sustainable, but also more cost-effective, uh, and to ensure that any investment that any government makes in transport infrastructure is hopefully less reliable uh, on expensive uh, carbon-reliant power. Uh, the Scottish Government's uh, Scottish Greenhouse Gas Emission Report uh, highlights that in 2016, transport emissions account for 37.3% of our total emissions as a country, so over a third, and that's a lot. That report also highlighted that road transport was the largest source of transport emissions in Scotland, and that's grown by over 7% since 1990, admittedly, and probably likely due to the increase in vehicles in our roads. Now, we had a debate in this parliament quite recently, uh, many have spoken it, around the uh, efforts to uh, roll out uh, ultra-low emission vehicles, and it was an excellent debate. Uh, but I would like to reiterate some of the challenges that came out of that debate that was expressed by members from across the board. It is fair to say that there is still an insufficient number of charging points, especially in remote in rural areas. There are still substantial issues <clears throat> around range anxiety. Range anxiety is simply when you're worried about running out of power and having nowhere to charge your car. And also the lack of standardization of charging points. Now I appreciate government isn't necessarily in control of what business does, uh, but uh, surely it, it can take the lead in improving standardization. And also the significant higher costs of these types of vehicles. They are anything from 10 to 30% more expensive at the moment, although becoming more affordable as the days go by. And I hope we can uh, take a look at some of the great work that other countries are doing in ultra low emission vehicles. <clears throat> how do we touch uh, on this area of charging points as a barrier to update, uh, uptake and how do we get over that? Let's look at the example, for, uh, for example, of uh, Amsterdam, uh, which is uh, doing an excellent job of improving uptake. The, the Dutch government provide charging points as, res as residents register their electric cars. It's a method of collecting data so that they know the quantity and scale of car ownership in those streets or areas. And as a result, we'll make targeted investment in where the charging points should be rather than an arbitrary or sporadic rollout of charging points. Now, I'm sure the minister in his statement will uh, tell us about the numbers of charging points that exist. It's not about how many they are, it's about where they are. If you cannot charge outside your front door because you're parked streets away, then you're very unlikely to buy one of these types of vehicles. <clears throat> we, uh, as a party, produced a, a publication recently, uh, Global Challenge, Local Leadership, Environment and Climate Change. It was a position paper that set out a number of, I think, very useful ideas and measures that we would like to introduce, to introduce take up and growth in this type of vehicle ownership. Uh, I'd also like to touch on some other types of technologies today in the brief time we have, specifically hydrogen. It's a conversation we haven't had much of in the Parliament, but I think it's an important one. Hydrogen technology is, is a, a reality in the world today. It can deliver almost carbon three transportation. Uh, if we look at Germany, for example, which I think is a world leader in use of this type of technology, they're using it on light rail, they're using it on their mainline services, uh, and it's increasingly taking over from diesel-powered passenger trains as well. And I have many examples of, of that, which uh, I won't list today. But we know Scotland it can be a pioneer in hydrogen technology. I, I appreciate there's some great work going on around uh, hydrogen marine technology and the introduction of uh, a ferry that will service uh, using that technology. But we also have to have a source of that power as well, and that requires infrastructure. How do we get this fuel into the country in order to use it on a day-to-day -day basis? So there's welcome progress, but I think there could be more done. I also like to touch on another type of technology, which I think, uh, and I'm learning more about every day, and that's battery. And the use of battery, especially on rail, 
Uh, if members aren't aware, in effect, uh, battery packs can be added retrospectively to existing electric trains. So we talk a lot about the new class 385s that are coming on board uh, in Scotland and that, again, they are welcome, the move to electrification. But you can also attach batteries to these types of trains. And what that effectively means is they can go off the grid where there are tracks which rely on overhead lines and can use lines which are traditionally used by diesel trains. So you can have an electric uh, rail that's operating on a non-electric line using the battery power to get it to where it needs to go. The range is increasing uh, as technology increases. This technology is used extensively in Japan, for example. And what happens is the train simply pulls into the station and charges for a few minutes at the station before heading back out on its journey. So there is technology out there, that plus LNG and many other types of, types of technology that I think we as a country could be uh, focusing our, our investment on and working with industry hand in hand to look at how, as they uh, are, are making progress in the space, government can intervene as well. I think if we are truly uh, want to tackle climate change, we really need to lead the way in the world when it comes to emerging technologies. That means uh, increasing our R&D capacity, it means increasing targeted investment and the right sort of investment in new technologies, and it also means fostering, I think, a country that inspires new businesses to come here uh, and work with government uh, to introduce uh, some of this uh, new technology. If we want to remain ahead of the rest of the world, and indeed ahead of the rest of the UK in tackling climate change, we need to stop talking more, but start doing more. I believe that the Scottish Government is committed to some of these obligations. We are committed, and we as a parliament are committed, but we need to stay, take some tangible steps and measures to introduce this. Uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, I appreciate it's lunchtime for many members. Um, but I would like to thank, again, members for supporting my motion. I hope that this debate today, as short as it may be, will stimulate some conversation around how we, uh, as a society, can introduce technology as a way of meeting our climate change objectives, but also making transport safer, cleaner, and more cost-effective. Thank you, President Officer. We move to the open debate, and I call... Oh, yes, sorry. I called David Torrance to be followed by Colin Smith. Almost <laughs> forgot about you there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, President Officer. Uh, I'd like to thank Jamie Green for securing this important debate on sustainable and renewable transportation in Scotland. Transport contributes to over a third of air pollutants emitted in Scotland's atmosphere, and any progress that can be made in this sector to reduce emissions is worthwhile. It's well documented that air pollution is having a grave effect on our environment, causing global temperature rises, shrinking ice sheets, sea level rises and extreme natural events. Long-term exposure to air pollution can also affect public health, as it is known to cause respiratory issues, heart disease, and is linked to a wide variety of illnesses. It's clear that steps must be taken to tackle carbon emissions and reduce the harm caused to our environment. Scotland has always had a forward-thinking attitude to the reduction of carbon emissions. We are currently on track to outperform the interim emissions target of at least 56% reduction in emissions by 2020. And Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Glasgow have been named the top three greenest cities in the UK based on everything from recycling, air quality to a number of electrical vehicles and green spaces. The Scottish Government is continuing to encourage the reduction of emissions, particularly in the public and private transportation. Significant investment has been made in infrastructure for alternative fuel vehicles, both by the Scottish Government and local authorities. As part of the process of dueling the A9, electrical vehicle charging points have been placed at various points along Scotland's longest road, adding to over 2,000 connection points across Scotland. This will help tackle range restrictions with electric vehicles and break down perceptions of long-range electric travel as an inconvenience. Scotch Power is also helping to encourage private citizens to make a switch to electric vehicles by introducing a new tariff aimed at electric vehicle owners that allows users to access discounted charging during off-peak hours taking advantage of cheaper electricity rates through their smart meter for the first time and all from 100% renewable electricity. Local authorities are also taking steps to address carbon emissions by increasingly turning to hydrogen-powered fuel cell vehicles as a solution to reducing their transport emissions. Hydrogen is a sustainable zero-emission fuel that can be compressed and stored for refueling of a fuel cell vehicles. The only waste products produced during combustion are water and heat, meaning they emit no greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Fuel cell vehicles are also more comparable to conventional cars than electrical vehicles as they take less than 10 minutes to refuel and have a driving range of between 200 and 300 miles, depending on the model. This makes them more appealing to drivers with long commutes and those who lack plug-in access for electric vehicles at home 
or outside, or to organisations with commercial vehicles that have a long distance requirements. The bright green hydrogen site in Methyl has allowed for lower emission vehicles to be used by both Fife Council and local businesses in the area. Their energy storage system uses excess green energy generated from their on-site wind turbine and solar PV system to create hydrogen storage. The storage hydrogen is used to power a site's microgrid at times when there's a deficit in green energy production, but it's also used to power 17 hybrid vehicles that were deployed in the Methyl area in 2017. The fleet includes 10 hydrogen electric vans, five hydro diesel vans, and two specially adapted hydro diesel refuge lorries, which are thought to be the first of its kind in the world. The energy storage system supp supplies hydrogen to two mobile hydrogen vehicle refueling units, which are based on ISO shipping container dimensions, so it can be readily transported and easily located from site to site. An additional hydrogen storage and refueling station is located at the council's bankhead vehicle depot in Glen Rothes off the A9 trunk road. Fuel cell, cell vehicles are also being used to reduce emissions from public transport networks in our major cities. Aberdeen already has one of the most advanced multiple hydrogen powered fleets in the UK, including 10 buses with another 10 due to be introduced. The buses are not only emission free, but are quieter than conventional buses, reducing air and noise pollution. By end of 2019, there are set to be 60 fuel cell vehicles operating in the Aberdeen area. Additionally, the city's refueling centre is now open to the public, so anyone wishing to cut down on their carbon emissions can make a switch to emission-free vehicle. I would like to encourage everyone to consider the option of electric or hydrogen power vehicles when thinking of replacing their car. I'd also like to see a faster move towards environmentally friendly bus services across Scotland, especially in our cities. And in conclusion, President Officer, various projects around Scotland utilising renewable energy and alternative fuel sources in transportation are beneficial not only to individuals that use them, but to local communities they serve by improving the quality of the air they breathe. As CO2 remains in the atmosphere for up to 100 years after emissions, the effects of these reductions will be felt for generations to come and the efforts will be continued to cement Scotland as a leading player in the renewable energy industry. Colin Smith, followed by Maurice Golden. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you to Jamie Green for tabling his motion, which has enabled today's debate on this uh, important issue. As we've already heard, transport accounts for 37% of Scotland's emissions, so it's clear we won't meet our environmental obligations without radical changes in our transport system. And I think the fact that Jamie Green's motion covers such a, a wide range of technologies that can contribute to helping meet those obligations emphasises the need for a, a multifaceted approach, an approach where every mode of transport has a part to play. On our roads, the Scottish Government's target to phase out the requirement for new petrol and diesel cars by 2032, combined with the introduction of low emission zones, makes the expansion of ultra low emission vehicles one of the priorities. Their numbers have increased in recent years, which is welcome, but electric and hybrid cars still make up less than 1% of road vehicles in Scotland. There is real need to address the financial and practical barriers that prevent people from using ultra-low emission vehicles. UK-wide research by the Department for Transport found that most private electric vehicle owners are, are middle-aged, well-off men in urban areas. Now, the estimated this demographic is unlikely to change, as it doesn't seem to be changing in many walks of life. And in the near future, with affordability remaining a significant barrier to the take-up of ultra-low emission vehicles. President Officer, more needs to be done to ensure the use of greener vehicles isn't a luxury only available to the better off, particularly as cities begin to move towards low emission zones. Now, in January, when we debated the issue of ultra-low emission vehicles, I raised concerns that there still remains a lack of a, a comprehensive long-term plan from the Scottish Government to, to break down the barriers that I've mentioned, incorporating the incentives, the infrastructure and the technological developments required to meet that 2032 target. The Minister replied by saying, I quote, the National Transport Strategy and the Network Vision Statement, which I will publish later this month, will give more detail on the necessity for investment in infrastructure to support EVs and their rollout more widely. Well, the end of January has come and gone, so I hope when summing up, the Minister may be able to update members on the publication of that statement. Uh, certainly happy to do Paul that, yeah. <coughs> thank, thank you, uh, thank you, Colin Smith, for taking an intervention. Uh, indeed, the delayed uh, publication of the network vision statement is to take on board more information about hydrogen, which is the subject of today's debate, and uh, hopefully helpful for me to reflect on today's debate in, in that document. But it's within good intent that it's been held back to make sure we reflect uh, the recent developments in the hydrogen economy. 
Colin Smith. Well, I thank the Minister for that answer and hopefully we will we'll see the publication of that statement sooner rather than later because the clock is ticking when it comes to, to developing and supporting this technology around cars. But of course, the reduction in transport emissions won't all be met by a move away from diesel and petrol cars because that in itself won't tackle congestion. We need a model shift from cars towards public transport and active travel. And that public transport, of course, needs to be environmentally friendly. Hydrogen-based technology has an important role to play, as we've heard already from hydrogen ferries to the new hydrogen buses being rolled out in many parts of Scotland. There have been suggestions, of course, of the UK's first hydrogen power train running by 2022. The role of electric vehicles will also be important from electric buses, which are now a familiar sight in our communities, to more mm -hmm. electrification on our railways. But I believe, as Jamie Green's already highlighted, that it should also include doing more to explore the use of battery-powered trains. These trains has, as we've heard, the advantage of running and being charged on the electrified parts of the railway, but also be able to continue to run using battery on the tracks, which haven't yet and never will be electrified. And that opens up huge opportunities for many parts of our network. This greener public transport will require support and the will to deliver. With buses, that means public subsidies being set up in a way that incentivises investment in a greener bus fleet. With ferries, we need a long-term ferry strategy and the national shipbuilding plan to set out our plans to replace and upgrade the fleet in an environmentally friendly way. And with rail, we need a greater focus on delivering greener trains, vigorously pursuing options such as hydrail and electric batteries, so we're not solely dependent on electrification, which is slow and an expensive process. But across the board, of course, one of the most effective ways to improve public transport would be to take our railways back into public hands and promote more publicly owned bus services. This would ensure profits are reinvested back into providing services that are not only greener, but more reliable, more affordable and more accessible, ultimately ensuring that our public transport puts passengers, not profits first. And on that consensual point, I'll end there, First Minister. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is from Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I believe that any move to build sustainable transport systems must include a transition to electric and low emission vehicles at its heart. The case for cutting transport emissions is stronger than ever, uh, particularly given that emissions have remained broadly unchanged since 1990. Moreover, this would boost public health by cutting air pollution, which is estimated to contribute to 2,000 deaths every year. Finally, it would help all drivers, particularly those low earners, with running costs for electric vehicles around a tenth of those for petrol. And it's only fair to recognise the steps that the Scottish Government is taking. For example, designating the A9 as Scotland's first electric highway is to be welcomed, both as a practical means to help adoption and as a statement of intent. The same can be said of the 500 new ultra-low emission vehicles the Scottish Government announced for the public sector. The Scottish Conservatives recognise the role of the public sector and how it can play in that and have already proposed conducting cost-benefit replacement analysis and mandating consideration of electric vehicles in future public procurement. So too, a commitment to expand the electric charging network with extra funds committed to that effort echoes our policy of expanding the network across our rural communities. It is understandable many people might have the range anxiety uh, over being stranded if they run out of power with no charging point nearby. So expanding the charging network is a vital step to remove that barrier to adoption. Welcome as these measures are, unfortunately we, unfortunately we are not seeing the progress we need yet. For example, between 2010 and 2016, the Charge Place Scotland scheme saw just 13 charging points installed in Renfrewshire and only three in East Dumbartonshire. And there is also the unresolved issue of standardising charging equipment. This is a must if we are to facilitate mass adoption and minimise costs for consumers and businesses. And costs are an issue. Even with support, electric vehicles remain prohibitively expensive for many. Underscored by the SNP's electric vehicle loan scheme receiving just 416 applications and with under 500 vehicles purchased over seven years. Add to the fact there has been no serious consideration given to how to nurture the second-hand market to widen access. 
The reality now is that fewer than 1% of Scotland's 2.9 million cars are electric. And the same goes for new vehicle registrations. Fewer than 1% were electric in 2016. Even by 2030, projections show electric vehicles constituting just 27% of new car sales, with the deadline for reaching 100% a mere two years later. None of this is said for the sake of being critical, but to highlight the scale of the challenge. As I mentioned, there's a political common ground and a role for the public sector, but we must not forget the private sector. A good example being Scottish Power, who, having met with them, I know are working hard on improving the grid system that underpins efforts to expand charging networks. And on the consumer side, they have introduced a new smart meter tariff to make vehicle charging cheaper. With the political, public and private sectors working together in tandem, we have a road to success. We just have to take it. Thank you. I call Paul Wheelhouse to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank Jamie Green uh, for bringing this important debate to the Chamber today. Uh, Decarbonising transport, I certainly agree with members across the Chamber, is one of Scotland's biggest challenges in meeting our greenhouse gas emission targets, and it's a challenge that we're tackling head on. Uh, looking to the future, our plans for transport will see the greatest emissions reduction in absolute terms of any sector over the lifetime of the climate change plan, so it's important that we start to, to, to make progress. And this is clearly vital work. It's good for Scotland's health. David Torrance made some excellent points around the impact on health in terms of air quality. It'll help protect our precious environment that we all care about. And innovative approaches to low carbon transport have the potential to bring real economic benefit to Scotland as well. Indeed, harnessing as many of these benefits as possible for the people of Scotland is, I'm sure, all our, our focus in this chamber. In our debate last month on ultra-low emission vehicles, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity in opening the debate described various forms of support we're providing to encourage the transition to electric vehicles. And many colleagues across the chamber highlighted the importance of having a charging network uh, that's been repeated today uh, that provides comprehensive coverage across Scotland, giving people the confidence to buy and run battery electric vehicles. Uh, providing that confidence is also a clear priority for us. But we should reflect on what we have already achieved and be sure that we focus our attention on the most important issues. Not necessarily to big ourselves up, but I think it's important to get the information out there about how many charging places there are to try and give the confidence that members are seeking. Uh, so Jamie Green raised a fair point. So in response to that, the Charge Place Scotland network already provides 1,000 publicly available charge points. And this means we have one of the most comprehensive charging networks in, in Europe. On average, the nearest charge point is just 2.78 miles in Scotland. That's on average. There will be longer distance, obviously, in some localities, but it's 4.09 miles across GB as a whole. So I think we've still got an issue across the whole of Great Britain to resolve, but we are making relatively good progress in that respect. In addition, a number of independent providers have put in place charges at various locations. Taken together, there are over 2,800 publicly available individual connectors across Scotland listed by ZapMap, one of the leading listings of publicly available charge points. And in some cases, there'll be more than one connector at a single charge uh, point. So that, that probably underscores that there's actually more charging points than people may, might imagine. Even taking that into account, it shows Scotland uh, is well ahead of the European Commission's recommendation of one public charge point for every 10 plug-in vehicles. And through the Energy Savings Trust, we have also supported the installation of 350 uh, workplace charges in 2018-19. Uh, uh, that's to add to 461 that were already installed and 1,200 domestic charges in 2018-19 in addition to 1,928 that had already been installed. So they're actually perhaps uh, more than we've given ourselves credit for in the past in terms of uh, charging points out there. Some businesses, as Jamie Green and Morris Golden and others have recognised, already have their own points and organisations and individuals are likely to have made their own arrangements without public support as well. So there, there probably is more than we believe. But a lot of the public debate is focused on the Charge Place Scotland network as this is the main publicly operated network. But what is most important, we believe, is the overall accessibility of charges for EV users. We're committed to continuing to fund the public EV charging infrastructure and working with local authorities and others through programmes such as Switched on Towns and Cities. But we have to be sure we're providing the right kind of investment. I take the point about making sure we get the investments in the right place, and that is, that is an important factor. We'll continue to add charge points to the network where there is a need to ensure coverage. Our commitment to the electric A9 that was refer referenced by Morris Golden is an example of this, but an equally important focus will be ensuring that the current network is well maintained and supported by excellent customer service 
and it keeps pace with changing technology. But of course, the burden of charging EVs in Scotland will not fall to the Charge Place Scotland network alone. An analysis suggests that on average, EV drivers use the public network for 10% or less of their charging needs, uh, with the rest charging at home, at work or in other destinations. So there's a mix of, of usage there. And we'll continue to talk to the sector to make sure we stay ahead of developments uh, and uh, across our trunk roads, our workplaces, destinations and at home, and make sure it happens in as smooth and effective way as we can. I want to turn though to other points that are made about wider transport system and support for EVs and charging is just one of the most visible demonstrations of this of course. But activity goes far beyond this and a number of examples have been referenced by colleagues across the chamber. We're tackling freight emissions through support for local authorities to deliver EcoStars programme for HGVs. We've set network rail challenging but achievable regulatory targets to go rail freight which produces 76% less carbon dioxide than road freight per tonne of cargo. We'll introduce an improved bus service uh, operators grant low carbon vehicle incentive from the 1st of April this year and we'll also bring forward a new Scottish Green Bus Fund with money available over the years including infrastructure for the first time uh, weighted towards the lowest emitting buses and we'll continue to put a shift uh, towards active and sustainable travel uh, to combat health issues uh, related to poor air quality that uh, Mr Torrance referenced. Um, on hydrogen, which has been raised by uh, Colin Smith, other colleagues across the chamber, and the reason I mentioned the, the network vision statement, because I'm trying to listen to stakeholders about needing to reflect the need for hydrogen, and we'll probably do more detailed work for, throughout the year on this. Uh, we are on the verge of a transformational shift in the use of hydrogen, and Scotland has the natural assets and the skills and experience to fully exploit the potential for hydrogen uh, to help decarbonise both our transport and heat systems. We've supported a number of world-leading hydrogen demonstration projects. I won't go through them all. I'll make sure there's a list that's available, presiding officer, to, uh, to colleagues who've taken part in the debate. But over £6 million support for the procurement of hydrogen buses in Aberdeen, which was referenced by Mr Torrance. £1.3 million for the Orkney Surf and Turf project in EDA using tidal and wind energy to power the production of hydrogen for use in Kirkpool and uh, for potentially the, uh, the, the hydrogen ferry, which has been uh, commissioned to service the, the route and £4.3 million for Leavenmouth Community Energy Projects, again referenced uh, by Mr Torrance because it's in his constituency, demonstrating the role that hydrogen can play in low carbon energy system. Uh, and we need to seize the moment to build on these and other projects in Scotland, developing economically sustainable models for the production and use of hydrogen, from providing support to grid balancing and utilising constrained renewable energy to direct use in heat systems, where we could see a very low percentage of hydrogen injected into the grid at the moment being increased over time. Uh, and increasing into transport applications. Hydrogen presents an opportunity to significantly decarbonise our energy use while releasing the uh, uh, potential for new technologies, businesses and economic benefit across Scotland. And the role of, uh, and value of hydrogen in our future energy system will, as I say, form part of our electricity and gas network vision statement, which we will publish shortly. And as the First Minister referenced at FMQs, the, um, the Scottish Government wants to transition to a low carbon economy, just to be, to be a, not just to be a just one, but one which ensures that no one is left behind as our technological and economic landscape develops. And that's why we've established the Just Transition Commission, which met for the first time on the 31st of January, and which will consider how the benefits of a transition to a low carbon economy can be shared widely across Scotland. Uh, while the emergence of these new technologies provides an opportunity for Scotland to become a world leader in low carbon innovation, it also has the potential to provide very high quality job opportunities uh, for individuals across Scotland. And that's why uh, an element that's not been mentioned today, which is very important and as we roll out low carbon transport, is around skills. An energy skills partnership uh, and skills development Scotland uh, are working to support uh, Scotland's learning institutions to develop the skills base needed to deliver and maintain a sustainable low carbon transport system for Scotland which provides economic and environmental benefits for Scotland as well as for individuals and I know that includes provision of electric vehicles to colleges so they can train uh, the, the apprentices of the future in how, and indeed uh, retraining those who are already in the workforce to adapt their skills to, to service a growing fleet of electric vehicles. In conclusion, presiding officer, uh, the, the shift towards low carbon transport has the potential to unlock massive opportunities for Scotland. It's great that there's uh, a great degree of consensus on that point. Uh, we believe business, businesses will benefit from access to these uh, burgeoning new markets and individuals will also see huge benefits. But we're already seeing encouraging progress in the uptake of battery electric plug-in hybrid cars and for the first steps towards adoption of hydrogen and bus fleet, fleets, rail and ferries. Uh, I commend the Scottish Cities Alliance for, and their partners for the work they're doing to encourage their members and neighbouring local authorities to adopt a more collective approach 
to the work on low carbon transport and energy and the Scottish Government will work closely with all colleagues in the Chamber who have an interest in this uh, but I thank uh, everyone for their constructive tone today and look forward to working with them as we decarbonise our transport system. Thank you, Presiding Officer. That concludes the debate and this meeting is suspended until half past two.